If we ever, ever find signs of creativity in our society, or if we ever find it in the companies that we work in or run in, how can we kill it? How can we get rid of it? How can we murder it? How can we slaughter it? How can we make sure it will never come again? I'm going to talk about that today. But I'm also going to talk about If we have creativity, there are signs of creativity here and there, behind the carpet, under the carpet, behind the curtain and so on. And somebody wants to kill it. How can we keep it alive? So that's another discussion. And then I'm going to talk about aliens. Why are you all leaving? So I'm going to talk about a fantasy I once had, and this was about aliens who have been watching the Earth for a couple of million years, and how bizarre that experience must have been. I imagine that two million years ago, aliens, they came, they were traveling around in a spaceship on an expedition, they see Earth, and then they see a lot of life, lots of species, and then they send an email back to the mothership, and that email says, it's full of life, it's fantastic, it's amazing. And then a, another email rushes back from the spaceship, and it says, Is there any intelligent life? Have you seen any signs of that? And then they write, yeah, there are some hairy things, hairy things, and they kind of walk sometimes on two legs, and they have something like hands, seem a little bit intelligent, not too much though. Email comes back, and it says, do they use instruments? And they say, yeah, they actually do use a little bit instruments, sticks. Sometimes they pick up sticks. Whoa. So um, another million years passes, and a new expedition comes to follow up on what's going on on this planet. And emails go forth and back. What, how is it going with that semi-intelligent species you saw? And then the answer comes, they have less hair. And also, they seem more intelligent, and their brains have grown. Okay, so what about the instruments, tools? Uh, the answer comes, eh, rocks. They, they use rocks now. Sharpen rocks, they do that. Cool, cool. So, uh, 200,000 years ago, that species had turned into Homo sapiens. 200,000 years ago, they had a brain about the size that we have today. So, the expedition come back, they look at it, and then they ask, how's it going with instruments? And they say, they, uh, they, mm, a, few, mm, a few things, they do a few things. Most interesting is they're making ropes. That's, that's cool. And then back in the mothership, they say, okay, this is interesting, because you can combine a rock, a stick, and a rope, and make something out of that. And that's how innovation works. That's about combining things you already thought about earlier. So, uh, 10,000 years ago, the expedition came back, and then they see this. So they figured it out, and that's amazing. And it only took 190,000 years to figure it out. And that was about the speed of innovation we had in our sort of earlier days. Now, they, they come back about 3,000 years ago, and a lot has happened. So in a place in Iraq called Uruk, which I'm sure you're all totally familiar with, there's a big city, and for, for the first time you have what looks like civilization. And uh, this is really interesting. So they decide to come much faster forth and back and check up what is happening. So the next time they come, this 2,000 years ago, to see what's going on in Uruk, that must be amazing by now. So they come, there's nothing in Uruk. It's not cool. There's, it's really, it's gone. But China is fantastic. China is full of things. So you have architecture that is amazing. You have science, you have institutions, and you have this massive wall uh, building. So back in the mothership, they think, okay, this is, this is interesting. So Uruk was the coolest place on Earth, and then we come back, and then there's nothing. And then certainly it's China that's so cool. Okay, 800 years ago, it came back again. And I, I promise to stop this after a while. Okay? So 800 years ago, it came back again, and now it was Islam. So Islam had the most amazing art and architecture and science and so on. So they were really, really uh, impressed by that. So now Baghdad was probably the most advanced city in the world. Cordoba, which was Islamic, uh, uh, Egypt and so on, was amazing. And then they came back just after World War II. And as they approached Earth at a very great speed, 
they saw this completely surprising, amazing sight of artificial light everywhere. And then they started studying what had happened there. And then they found out that Western Europe had become increase, in, incredibly creative and Western European had colonized a lot of, of Earth and they had developed a lot of technologies. So that, I said, that experience would be bizarre and it would raise some questions. Like the first question, why did creativity start so slowly? If we were so clever 200,000 years ago, couldn't they even in 100,000 years invent, for instance, a bicycle? In 100,000 years, could they not do that? Another question is this, why does creativity often stop? Why is Uruk not the absolute center of creativity today in the world? And the third one is this, why did the West become uniquely creative? So, as I said before, the core of creativity is combining things you have invented previously. And we keep doing that. Now I'll show the, the axe, but here's another product. This is the iPad. If you think about how many things you need to combine to make an iPad, it's just mind-blowing. Maybe you need a, the effort of a million people to assemble one iPad because you have the plastic, you have the processors, you have the metals and so on. And we keep doing it. So this is another uh, new technology, the Segway, where you have combined different concepts, computing and wheels and so on. And we can just combine, combine, combine. For instance, we can put those two together. So you put the iPad on a Segway and we have invented an artificial boss. So the logic of combination works like this. You have two products called A and B and then you can combine them into AB. So now we have three products and then we can combine them into six products. So now we have six products. We can combine those into 14 products. We do it again. Now we have 20 products. We can com Does anyone have a calculator? Anyway, we can combine that to a lot of products. And about that time, where we get to about this level, we sort of get stuck unless we start trading with each other. But hum humans, they started doing that a long time ago. So we start trading all these different combinations all the time. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. I saw a place that Amazon.com in the US has about 220 million different products. Don't know if that number is exactly correct, but it, with all the music and all the book titles and so on, it might very well be. So it goes on and on. And oh, by the way, I was wondering why does PowerPoint have fonts that are so small that you can't read it? I don't know if anybody has an answer, or I think you probably get, they got a call from some lawyers who asked, can you make fonts that you cannot read? That must be it. <laughs> but I'm using it here. So this is my theory. My theory about creativity, which I developed a long, long time ago, before anybody else, almost, is that our innovation, our accomplishment, our achievement has to be exponential because of the combination of things. And here I put my theory on a timeline that spans about 3,000 years because the first time we could put names to in who had new thoughts and new inventions is about 3,000 years ago. So I thought it was like that, and I thought I would maybe become famous or think about writing books, maybe the Nobel Prize and stuff, until 2003, where I read a book called Human Accomplishment, and it was written by Charles Murray, an American scientist. So Charles Murray and a big team of people, up to 50 people, has spent around five years investigating where human accomplishment had been made and when it had been made through all times. So their theory was very, very simple, or the method was simple. They read encyclopedias from all over the world, 163 different encyclopedias. And then they just looked in music and math and so on. Who's mentioned? Which names turn up? Who are they writing about? And then I said, if you are mentioned, simply said, if you are mentioned in half of all the relevant encyclopedias and handbooks in the world, you must be an important person. So they found 4,002 important persons who had made great contributions to our thinking, our technology, our science, etc. And then they plotted it in on maps. Where did people live when they had these ideas? And when did they have the ideas? 
One of the uh, observations they had was 97% of it came out of Western Europe or nations that had been colonized by Western Europe, which kind of really surprised me. So if we, need to, if we want to understand this, we need to understand what happened in Europe. So here we have the first part of the innovation, and this is from about 800 or 700 before Christ to 200 before Christ. And you see uh, it kind of spikes up, goes a little bit back, spikes a little bit up. And then we have the next 1,000 years. And this is where I realized that I was not going to get the Nobel Prize. So my theory did not work. There was no growth at all in human accomplishment, human creativity during this long period. It was kind of the same on average from time period to time period. Then it started growing a little bit. And if you look behind the numbers there, in the next period, it was growing quite a lot in Western Europe, but it was declining in Islam and it was in the Ottoman Empire and in China. And then uh, there was a handball match on television the other day where Denmark scored two minutes, two seconds before the end of the, of the game. This, this is what happens with my theory. So in the last minute, it kind of catches up, but it still doesn't fit very well. So we have some explanation to do. And we have to go back in, in the history books and see what actually happened. So a lot of the early innovation, the ideas that we still talk about today, came from China, but they, if, we, if we look at Europe, they came from classical Greece. So what was special about classical Greece in those days? One thing was really, really special. I was, I was uh, in Greece with my sister this summer, and we talked with a historian, and he told us when... Greece had all these amazing ideas. Greece was not a country at all. It, it consisted of 700 to 1,000 city-states. It was a culture, but it was not a nation. It was lots of nations, 700 to 1,000 city-states. They had lots of ideas. Then came the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire picked up great Greek ideas. Actually, they sent people to see to look at how the Greeks ruled themselves, picked up the ideas and then scaled them up enormously. For instance, uh, they could do great buildings, great uh, armies. They built Hadrian's Wall across all of England, giant construction in six years. Today, you would need 20 years just for the building license. <laughs> so they, they could really do big things very, very fast. But they didn't have many ideas. Their art, their, their architecture, much of what they did was just old Greek ideas that they were reinventing and scaling up. And that's why we don't have a spike at all in creativity during that period. Then after that came the medieval age in Europe. And the medieval age is like pest and cholera and murder and torture and all that. And so we think of it as like a bad period, but it was an extremely creative period. And then there was the period of Western dominance. The so Western dominance was the, when the West... Western Europe, which was 3% of the world's land, land mass, within 10 generations went out and came to control the seas and control 85% of the world's land mass and about 80-85% of the world's economy. How did they do that? So, Charles Murray and his team, they made maps, as I said, and they made the map of where half of all European creativity during the entire period was. And I looked like this at, at this and I couldn't find any pattern in that. So some people have described how it's because of good rivers. So Western Europe does have good rivers. They don't freeze in the winter, they don't dry out in the summer, there are no waterfalls, you can sail up and down. So you can trade. And trade is essential if we combine things. That's how, as I said, that we get ahead. So here are the big rivers, and there's kind of an overlap, but it's not very good. And uh, they cannot explain the timing, because Western Europe was nothing, was nothing, was behind, and then certainly it caught up, and, but the rivers were there all the time. So it does not expect, uh, explain this catch up. Then I looked at maps, and then certainly I realized what it was all about. So this is a map from 1250, and I put color on the areas that are more decentralized. So then uh, came the Renaissance, and it started exactly in the decentralized part of uh, Italy. Then we go forward to year 1300, and year 1300, the decentralized area has expanded. 1500, it has expanded even more. And then started the Enlightenment, again, in northern Italy, and then spread out. And then if we look at the creativity map that... Uh, from the study I mentioned before, there's a surprising overlap between being decentralized and being creative. 
So if we go then fast forward again to 1517, then that's where Protestantism and the Reformation started. Where did that start? It started within the decentralized area spread into Switzerland with all its small cantons. Year 1800, the decentralized area had become smaller, but let's compare it again to Charles Murray's map of the core creativity in Europe. Again, a very good overlap. So there's a very, very strong indication that it was because a part of Europe was highly decentralized that Europe became so creative and remained so creative. So here's my conclusion. Centralization kills creativity. If you want to murder it, if you want to slaughter it, if you want blood everywhere, you just centralize your nations, you centralize your organizations, and it will die. You will get rid of it. Don't worry. That will kill it. That's how you stop it. You have to think about, there has been about 200 empires in the world, 200 empires through history. They're all gone. They're all gone because they kind of, they kind of over-institutionalize themselves. What if we then isolate ourselves in small units and say each unit has to have self-sufficiency. How does that work? Well, there have been some natural experiments where that has happened. And what uh, archaeologists tell us is, is every time a part of human population has been isolated from the rest, they have completely perished. They have, their culture has gone to decline. They've lost their technology and so on. That does not work. What does work is that you have small units that are networked. You have small units that think for themselves, but then they connect. Then they get disconnected, then they get connected again, then they get disconnected, then they get connected again. If you think about what happened in ancient Greece, that was what it was. You had all these city-states, each of them had their own decisions, but they also cooperated and they also fought each other. They also competed against each other. They invented the Olympics and so on. So that creates creativity. Same in medieval Europe, same in business. Business is a lot of small units that are networking. That's what works. If you want to have a creative society, you need to decentralize it. If you want to have a creative company or some functions of a company to be creative, you need to decentralize. I will show you a map. So imagine that our aliens are coming back with a spaceship, and then they see this. This is Korea. Korea was one nation, and then it got divided into two. One took the choice of making centralization and self-sufficiency, and the other one took a different choice. Thousands or hundreds of thousands of companies that were working and cooperating, competing internationally. So this is what you see during day. If you then pass it during the night, you see this. Thank you very much.